Okay, I think we're ready to go. So, a, a little bit of a, a late start, but we should be on track to get you guys out to lunch on time, because I know that's, that's a top priority in my books. Um, so, my name is Nastasha Pearson, and I'm here with my colleague, uh, Andrea Yi, and we're with Halsall Associates. Uh, it's a engineering and consulting firm across the country, as well as an office in Washington, D.C., and we do uh, all sorts of building-related uh, engineering and, and consulting services. We, we provide uh, building uh, condition assessments, we do green planning and design, we do structural design as well as restoration and cladding engineering. Uh, we're going to talk to you today about Murphy's Law and unintended consequences in building uh, enclosure design and construction. So Murphy's Law, we're, we're all familiar with it, I, I would say, to one extent or another. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And some people might think that that is their motto every day, is everything is going to go wrong. Um, but uh, what the anyth anything really means is uh, unforeseen uh, circumstances or unforeseen conditions or things that we didn't plan for popping up in our projects. Like anything, a piano isn't going to fall out of the sky, although that would be interesting if we did see that. But we're, we're referring to things that we didn't plan for, things that we, we didn't intend to happen based on our, our original design and our original design intent. So our uh, presentation is going to be pretty straightforward today. We're going to go through some project examples and um, some experiences that we had where things didn't go exactly as planned, uh, unintended issues came up. Then we're going to talk about some strategies that we would recommend to help control uh, and really manage what those issues might be. And then we'll just open it up for some uh, question and answers discussion. Uh, to start off, this is, these are the main topic areas we're gonna take a look at. We're gonna look at some trends in the glazing system industry. We're going to talk about large prefabricated cladding panels and, and some of the issues that might arise from using them on our projects. We're gonna look at what improving the thermal performance of our building really means. Like how, do, how does our intent actually compare to the end result and, and what are the implications of, of actually improving thermal performance, and then we're going to look at a few uh, low VOC materials and the implications that that has with the uh, flooring uh, construction. So I'm going to uh, pass it off to Andrea, and she'll start you with the, uh, the glazing system trends. So when we're talking about unintended consequences in, you know, building envelope uh, design and construction, I think it's important to talk about glass. You know, glass... Sorry, sorry about that. Um, so glass is one of those, you know, popular building materials. It's been used for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years now. Um, but it's become a lot more popular in the modern age um, as designers have come up with, you know, uh, you know, increasingly complex ways to integrate glass into our building design. Not only do we see it being used in, you know, windows and stained glass as we saw it being used in the early days, um, but now we're seeing it being used in curtain walls, canopies, railings, and even as structural members in glass floors, stairways, you know, walkways, and even full structural glass walls. Um, so it's important to understand why, why, we, why we use glass. We need to understand the properties of glass um, when, we're, when we're designing so that we can manage the consequences that come out of it. So why do we use glass? Um, first, firstly, it's a readily available material. Um, you know, it, we, we want to create uh, an environmental separation like any other building envelope material. Um, glass um, allows designers to have the ability to incorporate it into innovative designs such as the, the image here. This is uh, one of the, the largest columnless glass greenhouses in the world. Uh, located in Singapore, and this is just one of the many, you know, creative designs that architects come up with um, and uh, ways that uh, architects are able to incorporate glass into their design. Um, glass also fits well with, you know, the modern appearance, which is what we're, we're looking for in today's day and age, and also glass, most importantly, lets in good daylight while letting us achieve everything that we were just talking about earlier. But with the use of glass, you know, we run into all sorts of unintended co consequences. You know, we run into failures and glass breakage. We run into aesthetic issues. 
we run into complicated designs and construction and maintenance issues because we're using glass in increasingly complex ways. Um, we run into issues with glare and reflection and then also poor energy performance. Um, as we've heard about and when you know uh, in you know in the in the newspaper in Toronto they're often talking about all the high-rise condos in in Toronto and and the increasing use of, of full glass you know ceiling to floor walls and the energy uh, issues associated with that so the first issue uh, glass breakage um, is probably the most popular issue that comes to mind when we're talking about glass you know, glass is a brittle material. You know, it breaks. It breaks easily. We all know that. We see broken glass all the time. Um, but why does glass break? You know, br you know, glass can break for, for a number of reasons. Um, one of those being a premature failure. So if the glass has, you know, nicks or scratches, uh, it's going to fail before it actually sees the design, design loads that we in intended it for it to see. Um, if, uh, if it includes impurities or inclusions, there's a potential for spontaneous breakage. Uh, I won't get too much into that because I know there's been a lot of discussion in recent years about that and there's lots of papers around spontaneous breakage, but that is you know, one type of failure that we can run into. Um, if the glass is not properly supported, um, the glass may have a tendency to, to buckle and if it buckles beyond um, you know, what what uh, it's intended to, then it's going to eventually break and crack. And if it's overstressed, if it sees more or higher loads than it was intended to see, then it's also going to break. So the image um, that we see down below shows uh, glass being used in railings. So unlike you know traditional railing designs where it may be just supported simply at the top, bottom, or sides, um, we're starting to see point fitting supports being punched through the glass. Um, to support and hold the glass in place. But the problem is, like on the left image, glass is going to want to tend to move. It's not going to want to tend to move significantly. But if we don't allow it to move, uh, we're going to get something like the image on the right, um, where we're going to have extra stresses around the, the point fitting support. And you know, that overstressing can lead to failure if we don't design for it properly. So when we're going back and evaluating um, broken or failed glass, um, it's important to recognize the types of failure and evaluate why the, the glass cracked in the first place. You know, sometimes it's pretty obvious, you know, some, you know, some chairs run into, into uh, your railing guard you know, on a balcony or somebody's accidentally run into the glass, but sometimes there's more complicated issues such as spontaneous breakage. Um, and by evaluating the, the glass breakage pattern, we can kind of deduce what's kind of led to the failure and we need to evaluate whether there's a more systemic problem at hand that we need to address. Um, again, if it's an isolated issue such as a hard impact, you know, that's not such a big deal. But if we're finding that we're having a number of spontaneous breakage issues, we need to evaluate why that's happening. And unfortunately, we don't always have the luxury of being able to evaluate these breakage patterns in glass because if the glass breaks, if tempered glass breaks, it has a tendency to shatter into a mil million pieces. You know, it's rarely going to to hold together in place unless it's part of a laminated glass assembly. Um, but if you are fortunate enough to, to find the glass intact and you see something like the butterfly pattern in the, in the center, that can uh, tell you that uh, the, the glass breakage was likely due to spontaneous breakage. That butterfly pattern that you see in the center there is an indication of spontaneous breakage. So in about 2011, 2012, there was a, there was a lot of attention around glass breakage, uh, particularly in high-rise buildings. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily we were having um, more glass breakage events in those years, but it certainly caught everyone's attention. Um, but it does seem like we're getting more glass breakage events in mo you know, current years versus, you know, say, 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, and why is that? Um, we talked about the fact that glass is being used in increasingly complex ways, um, but some of the theories behind why glass, uh, we're tending to see more glass breakage, uh, particularly in high-rise buildings, is because we're starting to use more larger and thicker panels. As we use more and more glass in high-rise buildings, you know, for, 
for the floor to ceiling window wall or curtain wall, that means we're using larger panels of glass. And we also need to sometimes design to use thicker panels of glass because we also have higher loads when you have a high rise building, which is 30 stories tall. It's going to see a lot higher wind loads than a, a building that's say six stories tall. So we're designing for a, a lot more higher loads. And then we're also designed to fit um, the more complicated um, architecture that's out there. Um, so, so going back to the theories as to why we're seeing more glass breakage, so we're having larger and thicker panels, so that could potentially mean that there's more impurities in the glass. That's one of the theories out there. Um, but it also means that, you know, there's more handling issues. You know, when the guys are actually going to construct the buildings, you know, it's a lot more, it's a lot harder to, to carry around a, a t you know, a 10 by 8 piece of glass versus, you know, a small 2 by 3 sheet of glass. So you're more likely to run into, you know, defects such as, you know, nicks on the side of the glass or scratches, which leads to premature failure, which we were just talking about earlier. Um, some, you know, another reason why maybe um, we're noticing more failures in glass breakage is because more glass is really located outboard of the balcony slabs. You know, usually, or I guess say 10, 20 years ago, you know, maybe, or maybe a little further back, um, we were only seeing, or mainly seeing glass in windows. But now we're seeing glass used a lot more in railings, which hangs outside of the slab or curtain wall assemblies. Um, and similar type applications. And when the glass breaks, obviously, uh, you know, if it's located outside of the building, it's going to fall straight to the ground below uh, versus a window where there's a potential for the glass to fall inward as opposed to outward. So it's a lot more noticeable. You, you're gonna, it's going to catch your attention a lot more when glass breaks um, if it's outside of the building. Um, another reason is designs have less framing these days. Um, you know, with, you know, architects like you know, most, or a lot of architects, I won't say all, I don't know, everyone's got their own taste, but a lot of people like to see less framing. You know, we want cleaner looks, um, so that means we get less framing on the outside. So we have to come up with more innovative ways to support our glass, um, but as we come up with these more innovative ways, we also have to evaluate um, the different load paths now. Uh, it's not so straightforward as to it's not like the uh, the glass railing panels where they were just supported on the tops and bottoms and the sides. Now we've got these different complex load paths. Um, if you're say punching a support through the glass, you know the load path is going to be much more difficult to analyze. And sometimes there's not a uh, full thought put into that um, during the de design phase. Um, another reason is uh, we've got a lot more high-rise buildings in in uh, you know larger cities. In Toronto, for example, we've got a lot more high-rise buildings downtown now, especially with a lot of these uh, full floor-to-ceiling uh, curtain wall and window wall. So um, <laughs> when the glass breaks, you know, it's, it's going to fall to the sidewalk below, again, where there's a lot of people looking out and, you know, where they're going to notice. As, you know, if, if a piece of glass breaks on a high-rise bu building out in the subwer suburbs where it's a less dense area and it falls to the grass below, nobody's going to notice it. But if it, you know, if you get a lot more glass breakage downtown, obviously it's going to ca catch a lot of people's attention. So um, that could be one of the reasons why we're starting to notice more of these uh, glass breakage events. And then lastly, you know, sometimes, not always, hopefully not always, um, the frames are sometimes just under designed. They're not just designed to to receive the uh, loads that they're actually receiving. Um, we're building higher and higher. Uh, story buildings these days and we're getting um, you know much more increased loads and we need to be designing to accommodate those loads and um, we need to be doing checks to make sure that we're doing our due diligence and proper design in the early stages. So in response to the to the uh, increased number of glass breakage events in uh, 2011 2012 uh, there was a supplementary bulletin, uh, SB 13, that was issued to address these, uh, or to address these issues, and then to improve the overall safety of glass design in balcony guards. Um, some, maybe most of you, are familiar with it, but um, I think it's important to talk about. Um, so, for those of you who aren't familiar with SB 13, SB 13 essentially indicates the requirements for the type of glass that can be used in railings depending on its location relative to the outer slab edge. 
So if you're railing, if you want to design your railing to hang outside of the slab edge or within the two inches of the outer slab edge, then you are required by SB 13 in Ontario to use heat strengthened laminated glass. If your railing is designed to sit within two inches to six inches or 50 to 150 millimeters within uh, of the um, outer slab edge, you can use heat strengthened or lam heat strengthened laminated glass, sorry, or you can use heat soaked tempered glass. And then if your railing sits within six or more inches of the uh, outer slab edge, then you have the option of using the laminated glass, heat strengthened laminated glass, heat soaked tempered glass, or you can also use um, tempered glass, which is less than six millimeters thick. Um, so as you can tell, as your, your railing moves toward the inside, you have a little bit more leniency in terms of the type of safety glass that you can use. But as this diagram suggests, um, it kind of suggests that laminated glass is the safest option. Um, but the question is, is it really? Um, so for those of you who aren't, who aren't familiar, laminated glass is simply two or more glass lights laminated together with an interlayer. So essentially when it breaks, um, instead of falling into a, a, you know, a, a million different pieces, it's, it's supposed to hold together as one piece. But the problem with laminated glass is if you don't design for it to be retained in place after it breaks, it can actually have the potential to do a lot more damage than good. For example, this canopy here shows the post-breakage behavior of laminated glass in a canopy. As you can see here, the supports are holding the laminated glass in place, but that's not always a the case. Um, if you don't design for that, that broken laminated glass to hold in place, that can actually kill somebody, as opposed to a tempered piece of glass, which would shatter into a million different pieces. You know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to injure someone, but if you're only 10, you know, 15 feet above the ground, it's only going to injure you as opposed to potentially killing you with, um, with this large piece of laminated glass. So SB 13 does include requirements um, to, to protect us from these situations. They do require that when you're using laminated glass, that the laminated, la laminated glass um, is designed so that it will be retained in place um, after it's broken, but there's not really a lot of guidelines in terms of how it's, uh, how it's retained um, in place. For example, if you, if you look at the point supports in the middle here for this glass, it, it is holding it in place, but who knows how long. You, it's important to design it so that the glass is held in place long enough so that you have time to replace it and so that it doesn't fall onto someone while, while, you're, while you're making the arrangements so that it can be replaced. So it's just, it's just one of those considerations that we need to keep in mind when we're, when we're designing any sort of uh, glass assembly um, to make sure that um, we're, we're getting the consequences that we want and we don't face these unintended cons consequences which can actually make us worse off in the end. So the other option for, for glass which was closer to the outer edge of the, of the slab edge was heat soak tempered glass. So tempered glass is also another type of safety glass, um, similar to laminated glass, except it just breaks into 100 little pieces. Um, the problem with tempered glass is um, it has a lot more internal stresses compared to heat strengthened or annealed glass. So annealed glass is just your regular float glass, and then heat strengthened glass is just slightly stronger glass. So your annealed glass would be here in terms of strength, your heat strengthened glass would be here, and then your tempered glass would be somewhere up here. So the problem with uh, the tempered glass having more internal stresses is that um, there's a lot higher chance or actually really um, most of the spontaneous breakage events happen for um, tempered glass because of those um, internal stresses. So one way to, to minimize or reduce the event of these, the spontaneous breakage is to do heat soaking. Um, heat soaking is a procedure that's been around for quite a while now. It's, it was a quite a popular method in Europe, but it wasn't quite so popular in North America. But with the introduction of SB 13, glass manufacturers are having to catch on um, and um, get up to speed with the European standards um, um, to, because now this, you know, tempered heat soak glass is required in Ontario and potentially, you know, other North American markets. 
So glass manufacturers are, are purchasing these heat soak ovens to supply the glass that's now required. But the question is, are we actually getting what we asked for? Um, SB 13 ref references a European standard, but um, it doesn't seem like uh, there's, um, there's a lot of understanding surrounding this European standard. One of the, the most important things regarding heat soaking is that the heat soak oven is calibrated. If you're, not, um, if you're not soaking your glass to the proper temperature, then you may not actually be reducing the uh, potential for a spontaneous breakage down to what you had kind of expected. Um, so, you know, if you're going to be going through the effort of uh, going, getting heat soaked glass, you want to make sure that you're actually getting what you paid for. So it's important to check to make sure that whoever's uh, supplying your heat soaked glass actually has a calibrated oven and is doing the job that it's supposed to be doing. So as Andrea mentioned, we're, um, we're getting more innovative and more creative with our building designs and, and we're, we're, we're looking to give each building an identity and, and make it stand out and be different from other buildings on the block. Uh, with glazing systems and curtain walls, we're, we're, we're putting together these, these extremely complex uh, structures. They're, they're complicated to design, they're complicated to build, and they're also complicated to maintain. So these are two buildings that are actually here in Toronto. So the one on the left is the L Tower, which isn't too far from here on the Esplanade uh, uh, near uh, St. Lawrence Market. And the, uh, the, the two twin towers on the, in the photo on the right, are they, they're referred to as the, the Monroe Towers. They're out in Mississauga, the, the spiral twisting buildings. Gorgeous to look at. I, I, every time I see them, actually, I'm like, Looks pretty good, um, but at the same time, I also look at it and say, "Who's going to fix that when they need to deal with something on the soffit, or when they need to do just mass window cleaning?" And and so these these great ideas and these innovative designs, while they they look great, we we also want to make sure that we're we're considering okay construction, maintenance, fixing things. What is the plan for that beyond the design phase? How how are we going to tackle that with these buildings? This is an example of a project that we worked on in uh, St. Catharines. It's on the Brock campus. It's, it's the, uh, the new neuroscience building that they put up. So the identity of this building is it's, it's this glass cube and it's got uh, a large uh, screen on the south facade. So that's what you, you kind of see on the left side of the picture there. Now this screen cantilevered out from the building it had two uh, catwalks, and the intent of the screen was one to, to be a f aesthetic feature for the building as well as to control daylighting on the south elevation. Being part of this team, we, we discussed with the architects who said, hey, you know, this screen, and, and it, it's just south of this building, is just a big open parking lot. So it's not really protected. It's, it's exposed to a lot of wind, I can tell you, a lot of wind. Um, and we said, you know, in the winter, this screen is, is going to build up snow, it's ice, it's going to accumulate on the screen, and it's, you, you need to account for these extra loads in the, when you're designing this. So they took that into consideration. We, we made sure that the cantilever arms that were out supporting the screen were really robust. They were able to, to withstand the extra weight. Again, in the design phase of, of things, we said, hey, guys, you know, something else is, has come up here like look at the glass that's behind the screen what's the plan for for when this glass breaks how, how are we going to fix it um this screen is is quite the elaborate structure we don't want to have to disassemble the screen or, or disassemble the catwalk or to just replace a piece of glass that that's broken behind what are, what are we going to do should we consider something uh like a monorail or some sort of trolley system on the catwalk we already know it's it's built quite robustly that it can support the ex extra weight to, to accommodate this monorail, or maybe we, maybe we should consider that. Unfortunately, it wasn't <laughs> considered, and, and the, the, our, our concerns weren't uh, heeded. And as a result, only, I think, maybe one or two years into operation of the building, a piece of glass broke, and lo and behold, that piece of glass was located behind the screen. And so the uh, process to replace this glass was a little more uh, exaggerate or exuberant than it needed to be. So we've got the first crane 
that came, that's the, the tall blue one in the center. So that crane was actually there to lift the piece of glass up and lower it through a hole that they had to open up in the catwalk screen. The second uh, zoom boom is there so that way they could provide a man to make sure that that piece of glass went down as they're dropping it into the uh, opening easily. And then we've got a few other guys inside, outside, on ladders, everybody just working with this large, heavy piece of glass hanging from uh, the crane, just making sure that it slid in nicely and then when we could, we could put it back in. So it, it's quite a significant amount of e effort just to replace one piece of glass um, had the had the uh, the thought gone into it further, or sorry, earlier in in the project, we could have probably made this a little less painful. And and now this is what they're going to have to do every time a piece of glass behind that screen uh, breaks. Cleaning the glass. So the catwalk does have. Um, uh, lifeline, there's, there's like a, a, a track and then there's the lifeline through there. So it is, they can walk along there to, to clean the glass, but because they were such heavy pieces, actually getting the glass onto the catwalk and then moving it along so that they could put it in the right place, that's what we were suggesting the monorail for. Because um, it's, be, it's difficult to move the glass within that space. Uh, another glazing system trend uh, is re reflective buildings or reflective coatings on, on our glass. So again, we want our buildings to have identity. We want them to sparkle in the skyline. We want them to stand out. We want them to look spectacular. So in addition to that, we also want them to be energy efficient. A lot of the uh, energy use in these high-rise buildings, especially in, in downtown Toronto, is, is, is actually the cooling load in the, in the summertime. That's what really drives the energy, is, is how, how these buildings need to be cooled. So we say, okay, we don't want them to overheat. Let's reflect the heat away from this building with, with reflective coatings on our glass. So while that's really great for the building itself, adjacent buildings have to suffer the consequence of this reflecting light coming off. So we've got glare um, and we've got heat coming off onto uh, adjacent buildings. And, and as a result, if uh, an older building is adjacent to a new reflective building that just uh, was put up, they may see an actual increase in their cooling loads because of the extra heat that's coming off of their neighboring building. And so they have to put more energy into cooling their building. Um, we're, it's, it's almost getting to the point where we're turning our buildings into little like light rays, something from like a sci-fi movie. I actually heard a story, and this isn't in a uh, um, commercial uh, um, application, but uh, a homeowner was, was really a gun ho and he wanted to make an energy efficient home. And he, this is in the southern United States where it, he does get a lot of light into his home. And uh, he said, I'm going to put reflective coating on my glass, all windows, all sides, doing the whole works. Uh, didn't really think about his neighbor, didn't really think about his grass, didn't really think about anything uh, around him. And what he actually ended up doing was reflecting so much heat off of his window that it melted the vinyl siding on his neighbor's house. So <laughs> his neighbor wasn't too pleased with that, got a little annoyed, went and bought a big mirror from the Home Depot and just shot it all back at him. So it's not exactly the best way to handle everything, but we do need to uh, consider not just our building and not just what we're, we're putting on our building, but what's happening in the adjacent environment and the, 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 the surrounding buildings as well. Uh, so glare and, and daylight and l reflecting light from the exterior is one thing, but we also are, are we want to control how much light comes in. So interior glare can, can be an issue, especially if you consider high performance buildings or, or sorry, buildings that have strict performance requirements such as swimming pools or gymnasiums. They want to be well lit, they want to have a lot of light, but it can't be harsh. It needs to be well distributed and mellow and give everybody a good sense when they're in there that they can play their sports to the best. Also, just even in office buildings, um, when you think about the computers around the, the perimeter of the building, I know there's a certain time of the day when I cannot see my screen. I'm just saying, okay, I'm going to just keep typing, and at the end, I will make sure that everything is in there correctly, because the sun just comes around, and, and you can't see uh, properly with the, with the screen. So there are products available to help us control uh, interior glare and daylighting, and, and they're great. So we have, uh, for example, here, this translucent panel, and what it does is it, it allows light in, but it diffuses the light nicely. It gives nice, soft, even light to the space. Uh, in the application that we were involved in, it was used at a swimming pool. So 
they had to make sure they didn't have hard glare on the water because they needed to make sure that the lifeguards could see the pool clearly and they didn't get reflection and, and um, bad light lines. So the panel was a, did a great job in one regard, but it's still part of the whole building enclosure. It's still part of the whole building envelope, so it still needs to perform with regards to thermal performance, which it performs well. These are actually very well insulated panels, but it also needs to provide a water barrier and a weather barrier. And you can see from the side profile of this panel, we didn't have the most confidence that this was going to be a great weather barrier. The joints were open. It wasn't tight. We, we had a, a, a strict, um, I can't remember what the rating was, uh, we had a strict B rating for the building, and, and this was part of the curtain wall system, so it needed to meet that. So as a result, um, we needed to modify the system and make sure that we were adding supplementary seals so that uh, this panel that we were going to use was actually going to perform both for its in original intended purpose of providing good even light, as well as part of the whole envelope assembly and making sure the weather seals were all in there. We'll move on now to large prefabricated cladding panels. So we're talking about things like precast panels, curtain walls, even uh, uh, window walls where everything is unitized and, and made in a shop and then brought to site and snapped into place. Like Lego, love Lego. Um, so the thought process is, is that, you know, they provide fast installation, we just go and plop all our pieces in. They, they provide flexible design precast panels. You can get great textures. You can put windows wherever you want. You can do cool shapes. It's all, um, it's all done in a plant, so it's, it's, it's well taken care of. Uh, potential for high R values. You know, a, a precast sandwich panel, you got your four inches of insulation right inside the panel. It's continuous. It's, it's nice. There you go. You've got this nice beefy wall with a good R value that you're just going to plop into place. Good quality control in the plant. So. Concrete on site can be finicky. Sealants with the cold weather can be finicky. If you put all these pieces together in a plant, yeah, you got a lot easier. You can, can control the conditions. You can watch what everybody's doing. Everything can be clean. Uh, so when you put all these pieces together, these large uh, prefabricated panels, they should be really cost effective, a really good way to, to um, put a building up. What we need to consider, though, is that the panels are one thing. But when you get them to site, you've got how many of them? Hundreds? Thousands? It all depends on, on how, the, how big the panel is, how many there are. Uh, there's a lot of joints that need to be taken care of. Uh, and it can be difficult to address the tie-ins, the transitions. Uh, we need to make sure that the, the control layers that exist in these unitized panels still can exist when you connect it to the adjacent panel. Um, so with, with precast panels, for example, uh, sandwich panels, we like to ha see a two-stage joint. So we have our exterior seal, which is for the weather and the um, rain, we'll give it a good ru runoff, and our interior joint, which actually provides the, the main water shedding layer as well as the air barrier, a vapor barrier, all that stuff. It's, 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 the, it's the one that's really important. Um, when these precast panels go in, or when you look at the shop drawings, the shop drawings say 25 millimeter joint all the way around. Perfect, lots of space. I can install this thing no problem. But when you get to say what you find is, oh, that one's only 10 millimeters, that one's 12 millimeters. It's, it's way back there. It's a lot harder to install this sealant than I originally thought. Um, wait, maybe we should do it from the inside. Maybe we should install this, this primary seal from the inside. And you get to the inside and you see, oh, well, then I have to get around the slab edges and around the columns at the corner and the anchors. And there's a lot of detailing involved to make sure that you have a continuous um, barrier system when you use unitized panels. Here's an example of a project that we worked on with, with large precast panels. Uh, and here's a thermographic image uh, under the depressurized conditions. So we are sucking outside air into the building during this image. So you can see the bright red lines. Those are our vertical joints in the panel. And then not as distinct, but kind of fuzzy horizontal lines. Sorry, the bright red squares are all windows, just to make sure we all understand what's happening. So in between the windows, you see kind of fuzzy horizontal red lines. Uh, those are actually where the horizontal joints exist. Now, what you can see from the, the, the fuzziness in between there is that um, it looks like something's happening there. If you had a continuous thermal barrier from one panel to the next panel, you wouldn't see that kind of hazy, 
haziness at the horizontal joint. So what this image is showing us is that at the joint, something's missing. Maybe we should have installed some insulation in between all the joints to make sure that that great R20 that we had from one panel gets transferred to the other panel and our whole effective R value is actually what we think it is. Um, this, this shows that we're, we're missing some, some insulation between the joints. Now, where it gets a little scary now is we've got the, the building under pressure. So we've, we're, we're pushing inside air out. And what we can see from this image is that those same joints, they may not actually be there. They're not continuous. A lot of air is actually getting pushed through the building and, uh, and coming out. And, and this can pose a lot of risks for water leakage, uh, energy efficiency. You're just, you're just heating the outside at this point. Um, and it all comes down to the detailing of the joints of the system weren't carried out correctly. Now, I don't know if it was because the site conditions weren't there or it was difficult to reach or, or what happened, but ultimately it, it didn't work out as it should have. And this can really affect the performance of the building. I'll touch base quickly on a uh, window wall. So the photo at the left shows a picture of, of two window wall units put together. They look all nice. You mean we've got our exterior weather seal. We've got two large weep holes. Should be good. Uh, however, the, uh, the, the resident of the unit below was complaining that water was coming in. So we took off the exterior seal. And what did we find? We found that there was actually no detailing provided to drain the water out from one panel to the other. There was actually no end dams put at the end of the panels once they were slotted in. So water was just able to run down and into the suite. So we have to consider when we use these, these panelized systems, we need to consider the details. So yes, 90% of the building can go up lickety split. But the last 10%, all the detailing, that might take 90% of the time to make sure that you've got it done right. Um, Insulation, greatest thing since sliced bread, right? Uh, see the picture? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, but insulation is great. We, we improve the energy efficiency of our buildings, occupant comfort. It's, why, why wouldn't you want to use insulation? Why wouldn't you want to increase the thermal performance? What we need to consider when, when adding insulation is just because we add R20 to our wall, so we've got four inches of insulation, R20, good, I'm done, met the requirements. It's not as simple as that. There's a lot of uh, thermal bridging that occurs. How is the insulation actually fastened to the wall? What are the connectors? What, what is bringing it back? You may have a requirement for your um, building to, to have an R20 wall or an effective R20 wall. An effective R20 wall means that once you consider all your fasteners, your drip edges, your connections, your interfaces, everything put together, that you still have that, that insulated value. So what's interesting with the thermal bridging is that uh, a typical um, a typical metal cladding system that's supported with uh, Z girts? Uh, when you consider all the supporting elements and the insulation, even if you have R20 insulation, the, your R effective R value could be brought down to something like R11, R13. So you can considerably reduce the the R value. So. The thing is adding more insulation. So you say, OK, I'm going to add another two inches of insulation. That should balance it out. It doesn't work that way. The, the, the thermal bridging has such a significant effect that adding more insulation, you get diminishing returns. And eventually it gets to a point where you can't just add more insulation. You actually have to look at all the detailing involved to make sure that it's put together properly. Um, Adding more insulation can actually cause condensation risks if you're not putting your insulation in the right place. You need to look at the, the whole system and say, OK, if I put more insulation here, is that going to make my interior space colder? Is, is that going to provide a dead air space? And is, is there going to be a risk for condensation at that location just because I put the, the insulation in the wrong space? Um, Adding insulation to historic buildings could straight up ruin them. Uh, you, you could change the microclimate and the, the, the environment of that wall so significantly that your historic brick could freeze and thaw and, and spall off. Um, you could cause corrosion of embedded materials within the wall. And you could also cause wood rot of any wood joists uh, that, that run into the wall. We're going to touch base on this one a little bit more. Um, Here's an example again. We're, we're back at the swimming pool that we worked on, um, where they had a very stringent requirement for the effective R value. And we could not achieve that by using our typical um, Z girts to support the metal cladding. So instead, we had to use uh, these thermal clips intermittent throughout to get the effective R value. 
we even, oh, that didn't work. We even had to look so far as to adding additional, uh, a continuous ad layer of spray foam insulation on the inside of the wall to make sure, one, that we met our R value, but they also had really stringent uh, condensation requirements. And if you consider a swimming pool where your RHs are up in the 60%, the, the it's a warm swimming pool, maybe it's, it's 27 degrees in there, your, your dew point could be somewhere around um, anywhere from like, I think we had like 16 to 18 degrees was the range of the dew point. So it's very easy that a thermal bridge through this wall could actually be at that dew point temperature. And when you have such stringent condensation requirements, so zero condensation, we had to look into other ways of what else do we need to add to this wall so that we meet uh, those requirements. Uh, Construction isn't always on your side. You could have the best laid plans of we're going to put this insulation in, we've got it, we've taken into account our thermal bridging, we've got it all planned out. But when all the pieces come together and you consider all the tolerance differences between the different elements, you may not have the space. In this example, we were planning on putting our R20 insulation between the base of the precast and the outside of the um, supporting wall. But when we put the pieces together, we found, oh, shoot, we don't, we don't have enough room. There's, there's not enough space to give us... Um, for us to put the, the, the four inches in. So we looked into using a different material and in this particular application, we moved forward with uh, a, like an aerogel blanket. So it was a higher insulation, uh, sorry, a higher R value material per inch. And so we were able to accommodate it into that smaller space. Uh, so like I said, insulating historic masonry buildings should be a no brainer, right? They're, they're leaky, they're inefficient. Let's just spray foam them, get them nice and airtight, get them nice and warm. But what we, when we do that, we're, we're cutting off the interior moisture source that this brick was so used to seeing. So the brick is now colder, the brick is wetter, it has less potential to dry to the exterior, and as a result, the brick itself is more susceptible to freeze-thaw damage. And when these, um, these buildings, they're, they're solid masonry walls, so we can't, we can't sacrifice the brick. We, we actually we need it. And it's not just the brick. You may find through testing that your brick is actually really durable and you're not going to have a freeze-thaw issue. But what about the elements within the brick? So that same insulation layer that we add to the inside, it increases the RH of the wall because you can't dry outward anymore. So now you may have relative humidities within the wall that are in the threshold levels for wood rot and corrosion. So you, your RHs may start to hover around 75, 80% for significant periods of the year that you, you want to make sure that you don't cause a risk to the other elements in that wall by trying to improve the thermal performance. And going through the whole process in the end, you may decide, you know, maybe insulating this wall actually isn't the best bet for it. Let's look at other options. Let's just, let's see how we can air seal it and make it as airtight as possible so we don't lose heat through air, um, air leakage, but maybe insulating isn't going to work. Uh, Andrew is going to talk to you a little bit more now about some fluorine issues. <coughs> So we've talked a lot about, you know, building envelopes, you know, a lot of tensions put into the design of, of your exterior envelope because, you know, that's what everybody sees, you know, and that's what's, you know, stopping water and air leakage from uh, or getting in and out of the building. Um, but it's not, uh, or it's, it's important to, uh, to remember your floors because often we run into issues with, with floors debonding or lifting and it can be, become quite a costly problem especially when the, the building's in operation. If you imagine a, a hospital per se, um, if you have uh, flooring lifting and debonding in a hospital environment, it's going to be a, quite a costly endeavor to replace the flooring while the, the hospital is in operation. It's not like you can just shut down the emergency ward just to change the floor. Um, and at the same time, you can also let it stay in operation with the flooring debonded. You know, how's, how's anybody going to get a wheelchair or a gurney across the floor if you've got, you know, these big blisters and, and pockets of, of water and air? So we've, uh, we, we start to see more and more issues with, with flooring, debonding, and lifting. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because there's been a shift in movement towards lower VOC materials. Uh, in general, um, we're, we're always moving towards greener and safer products. Um, and one of the ways that we move towards safer products is to, to require materials with lower VOCs. So there's actually federal requirements that put limitations on the amount of volatile organic compounds, VOCs, that, um, that are emitted from certain types of materials. And adhesives is one of those materials which is affected by these federal requirements. So 
um, you know, 30, 40 years ago, we used solvent-based materials, which were uh, a lot more aggressive in terms of their bond to the substrates below. Um, but with these low VOC adhesives and materials, uh, unfortunately, they just don't perform as well as the solvent-based uh, counterparts. And um, when, we, uh, when we apply them to the floor and, you know, you mix it in with moisture and, and, other, and other materials, we can uh, run into compatibility issues or um, issues of the, uh, of the adhesive re-emulsifying or, um, or just, you know, flooring lifting in general. So um, one of the ways to combat that issue is generally to control the moisture. So generally, moisture is one of those ingredients that, um, that, that causes these issues. Generally, if you're able to keep the slab dry um, and your floor and adhesives dry, usually you can avoid most of these issues. You'll still have issues with you know, um, material like improper mixing or improper application and surface prep, but those things can be dealt with separately. But, but these other issues with, um, with um, blisters or pockets of air uh, lifting your floor um, usually are um, in part a result of uncontrolled moisture. So it's important when you're designing your floors or your slab, slabs on grade that you're considering in the back of your mind um, how are we going to control the moisture. And we're not just talking about outside moisture. It is important to control any moisture vapor from the ground or any hydrostatic pressures or osmosis or any other ways that moisture can come up through the slab and, and attack your adhesives. Um, but there's, it's also important to consider the actual moisture in the concrete. So in, uh, in, in construction, you know, there's a large focus on, you know, getting, getting the, the building delivered on time, schedule and budget. Those are two of the top priorities when it comes to constructing any building. And unfortunately, flooring is one of those last things to go in. And of course, at the end of the project, that's when you're in the time crunch and, you know, everybody's pushing to get things done. So it's like, you know, just get that floor down. We, we need to get these guys into the building and we need to turn it over to our clients. Um, but the problem is, if we're rushing towards the end and uh, we haven't allowed for the, the slabs to sufficiently cure or dry out, per se, um, then we can run into issues um, when we put on impermeable floor coverings and we're trapping the moisture in, um, and that's when we start to run into issues with floors lifting and debonding. So it's just, it's just something else to keep in the back of our minds and to think about. You know, you know, there's there's all sorts of building materials and 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 details that go into designing and constructing a building, and you need to consider all of these these host of issues. You need to have a little bit of foresight um, and understanding the problems and risks that lie ahead of you, so that you can plan around and and, uh, and manage them accordingly. Okay, so. I know I feel this way sometimes. It's like, oh, geez, I can't win. I just I try to do something right, and it doesn't work. And, and I, it's, it gets frustrating. It, 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 we don't have to give up. We don't have to let Murphy's Law win. Now, I, we can't anticipate everything. Uh, we can't um, plan for absolutely everything. But we can do our best, and we can try. Uh, like I said, a, a, a piano isn't going to fall out of the sky, so we already have to worry, like, say, okay, we don't have to plan for the piano. But we, we should plan for, hey, you know, what if this detail shimmies a little bit and I don't have the space I have? Or wh what is the mechanical system doing here? Should I check that that's going to impact how my window is going to perform? There are things that we should take thought of and say, hey, you know what, we can plan for these. So. Communication is, is really the key uh, to help us manage our consequences. And all these uh, plans or these tactics and these methods that we have for managing the consequence, what they all come down to is communication and making sure that everyone on the project team is on the same page. Um, so collaborative design review. This is great. <laughs> um, as early as possible, as early as your project allows, and even if you've already got started and you didn't do this, get, get it going now, is, is bring all the, the people of the, on the project team involved to talk about the goals, talk about the objectives, talk about issues that they've had on similar projects in the past, share ideas. So architects, they know, they know about building design, and they're good at it. Uh, mechanical engineers, they know about mechanical systems and they're good at it. Building scientists, we know building science. 
and constructors, or sorry, contractors, they know how to put all the pieces together. They know how to build a building. Um, you can't be a specialist in absolutely everything. So get the specialists involved and, and bring them in early on to discuss these challenges and discuss these ideas. And you'll realize that people have a lot to offer and people have a lot to bring to the table to share. Uh, mock-ups. So mock-ups are, are, yeah, you know, do a mock-up. Yeah, okay. Yeah, done. Mock-up. We really need to invest in our mock-ups. We really need to have them be engaged with all parties. We really need to have them uh, be a, a tool to communicate and discuss the, the plan and the, the intent. So mock-ups also shouldn't just be one trade. Like, okay, curtain wall guy did his mock-up on this random curb. Well, why doesn't that random curb turn into the roofing upturn that it's going to be on the project? And we have the roofer there, and he sees how the curtain wall guy installs his, his, his pieces. And then all those little nicks and all those little details on the drawings that say by others, maybe at the mock up, they can decide okay, I'm going to be this other, you be that other. I know that when you put this piece in, I need to wait because my piece is going to come over top. Let's, let's, have, let's have the mock-up be a collaborative process rather than just um, one member, or sorry, one party of the team. Also, mock-ups should be a good time to discuss plan Bs because like we said, the mock-up is intended to, to prepare you for the most typical or, or the straightforward or the, the detail that you see the most on your project. But if everybody involved in the project is there, so the, the trades, the constructor, the um, owner to make sure they like how it looks, the architect, the building science guy, the mechanical, if they're all there, we can all discuss what the intent of this is. That way, if we come across a condition that's slightly different from the mock-up, um, the person installing it can say, hey, you know, I was at the mock-up and I know that they said the intent was X, Y, Z. I'm going to make sure that this condition that's slightly different falls in lines with that intent. It's, it's about communicating. It's about... Uh, making sure we're all on the same page and we, we know the plan for the project going forward. Laboratory testing, uh, we, we should test more, <laughs> is, is really what it comes down to. It, what do you need to prove? Like, do you need to prove that your system is meeting the performance requirements that are called out in the spec? Well, let's test it. Like, let's, let's actually say, like, this is a, um, a B7 curtain wall. I tested it. I know that. Um, we should test what we don't know. Uh, does it even make sense? Oh, there's one picture that didn't show up. We, we should test what we don't know. Does it even make sense to use certain systems and certain applications? So I'm going to jump back to historic uh, masonry buildings and insulating them. So all these pictures here have to do with the test process involved to determine the threshold for a brick sample off of a historic building. So. What we do is we take the brick and we uh, subject it to varying moisture contents and we, at each moisture content, we put it through a freeze-thaw cycle and we see, does that moisture content get it to the point where if the water in the brick expands, it's going to cause it to crack? Because all bricks have pores and pore structure and they allow for some expansion of the water. And we do that at varying moisture contents and then eventually we get to a point where we say, hey, you know, that's the critical moisture content. At that moisture content, that's where we're going to have damage to the brick. So if we know when we insulate it, it's not going to meet that moisture content, then, then it's okay. Yeah, we're happy. Um, so with the testing combined with computer simulations with programs such as Woofy and Therm, um, we can... Uh, get a sense as to what the actual in situ performance will be and we can make a uh, informed decision as to the direction we want to go. Uh, here's a, another example of a, a project where testing was was invaluable. It was, it was amazing. So this is in uh, Edmonton where we have constantly changing weather. In, in the course of a day, we may have some snow, we may have some sleet, some wet rain, and then sunshine all at the end. So uh, the architect had a really unique uh, vision for this building's identity. So they wanted to put up a terracotta screen over the entire facade. So we already touched base on screens and how they're really great for having ice build up and, and pile up on them. But terracotta is also a, a porous material that's also going to absorb and take in uh, water, so it's, it's going to take in a lot. So we were brought in and, and we raised the flag of, you know, we should 
test to see how this building is actually going to perform in this wonderfully hospitable climate of, of Edmonton. Uh, so we did some cold room testing, and this is a, a to scale model. So the same way that you do to scale models for wind tunnel testing, you can do them for cold rooms. Um, and they, we had all the weather data and we ran it through and we said this represents what's gonna, what this wall is going to be exposed to. And this is what we found as far as snow and ice buildup. And then you throw in the changing weather and we get some, some serious icicles, some serious buildup on this, on this building that could lead to some, some big problems. Thankfully, we were involved early enough in the design stage that we were able to work with the architect and, and the owner to modify the details for the envelope to accommodate more drainage. Let's get more water out and also uh, include some collection systems so that if any material does come loose, any snow or ice does come loose, it doesn't just like fall on the ground and cause a big problem. Um, we're, we're going to contain it and plan for it. So testing, yeah, the, the, the snow, or sorry, the cold room testing, not an in, it, it's expensive, like it, 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 it's, it's a process and it's timely, it'll hold up your schedule, but in the grand scheme of things, considering what the outcome could have been had it not been planned for or had it not been done, it, it's a drop in the bucket. Um, so Andrew's gonna move on with some field testing. So just as important as lab testing is field testing. You know, lab testing, it's done in a controlled environment um, where you have known variables, but sometimes that doesn't actually reflect the conditions that we're experiencing out in the field. So it's just as important to do field testing in addition to lab testing. So we were talking about flooring issues earlier, um, and we were talking about the importance of controlling moisture. Um, how do we know when we're, when we're um, constructing a building when the, the floor is ready and dry enough for us to install the flooring? One of the ways is to do field testing to, to check the conditions. Um, traditionally, or in the past, um, uh, flooring installers would, would do this moisture vapor emission test, which is the, top, uh, the test on the top left there, um, to determine the amount of moisture coming up uh, through the slab. But unfortunately, there's certain limitations with this test. Um, it only tells you the moisture conditions in the top about you know half an inch of the concrete. It doesn't really tell you what's happening deep down below. And then also the problem with this test is it's, it's pretty sensitive to the conditions around it. If you don't have a proper seal around the dome there and you're letting air come in from the surrounding uh, ambient environment, then it's going to totally skew your results and, and, and what you know the results that you do receive are not going to be representative of, of the conditions of the concrete below. So uh, it's important when you're doing this type of testing to choose the right type of testing um, and ensure that the information that you're getting is the information that you want. So in flooring, there's been a, a little bit of a shift to, to, um, to relative humidity testing, which uses uh, these in situ probes, which you insert into the concrete. And that gives you a, a, a slightly different moisture gradient um, and it tells you a little bit more information about the moisture conditions deeper down in, in the slab. Um, we were also talking about glass issues earlier. Uh, you know, we talked about laminated glass, tempered glass, um, heat strength in glass. You know, there's all sorts of different types of glass, but when we're, when we're specifying that tempered glass, you know, it's supposed to be the stronger glass compared to heat strength and, and annealed glass, how do we know that we're actually getting the tempered glass that we want? Sure, it's got that little stamp in the corner that says, yeah, tempered, okay, sure, oh, I got tempered glass. Um, we can't always take, you know, somebody's word for it. Just because it says tempered doesn't mean it's necessarily tempered. So one of the ways to check that is we can do testing. Um, the image on the right there um, is a surface compression testing that can be done to check whether glass is tempered or not. So what you do is you put, place this device on the glass and you take a number of readings for any certain glass and it measures the level of stress um, at the surfaces um, to see if it's meeting the, the, the minimum stress requirements. So for tempered glass, you'll see the red line uh, towards the bottom. Tempered glass is required to have a minimum of 10,000 PSI uh, compressive strength. Um, so the dots um, on, the, on the chart there indicate the readings for um, different types of glass from different manufacturers. So the red dots are from one manufacturer, purple dots are from another manufacturer, um, and so on and so forth. So you can see the readings are kind of all over the map. Most of the readings are above the red line, which is good. That means we're getting the minimum stress requirements that we want. But you can see on the left there, um, there are a couple of readings where they're actually dropping below the line. So 
in a single piece of glass, as the black line indicates, we, we take 10 readings. So maybe seven or eight of those readings are above, above the red line, um, and maybe two of the readings are below the red line. So does that mean we're okay? On average, we're above that 10,000 PSI that we talked about as a minimum requirement. Sure, I guess if you're taking an average, it might seem okay on paper, but if you think about it, in reality, um, you've got this section of glass where you might have the proper compressive strength, you know, about you know, 80, 90% of the glass face, but somewhere you've got this 10% or 20%, which is actually not meeting the requirements. So when the glass shatters, you've got that 80, 90%, which is gonna shatter into the tiny little pieces that you want, but then you've got the 10, 20%, which is gonna shatter into larger pieces. And who cares if your 80, 90% is shattering to little, into the little pieces that you want? It's that 10, 20%, which is gonna get you. If it's gonna shatter into those larger pieces, you know, they're all gonna fall down at the same time and they're all gonna fall down in the same spot. So if you get hit by that piece of glass, um, you're, it's not like you're gonna only get hit by those tiny little shards, you're gonna get hit by those larger shards as well. So it's important for the entire piece of glass to meet those minimum requirements. And as you can see also from the dots, you know, the, the stress levels will vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. Um, there's all these requirements in terms of standards for minimum stress requirements. There's all these quality control procedures that are out in the industry. There's a, there's a lot of procedures and standards for glass out in the industry. But who's actually checking this stuff? Um, unfortunately, a lot of this stuff is just self-regulated. We're, we're kind of relying on the glass manufacturers to do their own due diligence to make sure that their... Um, the, the, the procedures that they're implementing are being carried out as they should be. Um, when, we're, when we're asking for warm edge spacers or low E coatings or argon uh, to improve the thermal performance in our windows, do we know that we're actually getting that stuff? You know, again, we can ask for the submittals, um, you know, on paper, yep, it says I got argon, it says I got, you know, the sticker says I've got argon, I've, I've got my low E coating, um, but who knows it's actually there? Again. Um, just jumping back to the field testing, one of the ways is to, to make sure that you're doing field testing throughout um, to check and measure, to make sure that you're actually getting the argon. You're not just relying on that sticker or that piece of paper um, to say that you got what you actually originally designed for. Um, you wanna make sure that if you're paying millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, you're paying these premiums to, to, to get these upgrades of these low E coatings, um, argon and warm edge spacers, you want to make sure that you're actually getting it, or you might be paying hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars for nothing, um, which often happens. You know, we do these testing, this testing frequently for argon, and, and in many cases, we find that the argon is actually missing. And what was the owner paying for? Nothing. And so it's important to do these checks. And that kind of ties in with um, the QA, QC plans. So it's important to manage the consequences by having a good QA, QC plan in place. We put all this effort into the design up front. We're doing all these mock-ups. We're doing all this lab and field testing. But if we're not actually making sure that we're getting what we want in the field during construction, then all that design was for nothing. You know, if we're specking this high-end glass, but we're getting this low-end glass actually out in the field, you know, they're, they're doing all these substitutions and nobody's checking to make sure that we're actually getting what we designed, then all that effort up front was for nothing, like just throw it out the window. So it's important to have a strong QA, QC plan in place. Ask for the submittals, ask for the shop drawings, review the shop drawings. And then when you're out in the field, make sure that you're actually getting what it said on the shop drawings. Um, all that due diligence and all that, 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 those checks are important throughout construction if you wanna make sure that um, you're getting what you want and we're trying to, to, to mitigate any of these, the, um, the bad consequences. And it's important not to forget maintenance plans. Once we're all said and done, we've turned over the building to the owner, we can't forget about maintenance. Um, and actually, it's really, even though it's the last item we're talking about, it actually, we should be thinking about it way ahead of time. You know, as Natasha was talking about that building with the, uh, the screen in front of the glass, you know, they, you know, they came, you know, it's a fantastic design. The building looks great. But, you know, they didn't design with maintenance in mind. You, you need to think about these things up front. You can't think about it at the end. Um, if, we're talk if we're thinking about maintenance for that, that building with the screen in front, you can't, you can't design a maintenance plan at the end. You, 
we, you know, you had to incorporate that maintenance plan early on and make sure that you have a plan in place to replace your glass or clean your glass, et cetera. So um, it's, it's important to have these, you know, um, glass cleaning happens for, you know, is, is a, happens obviously all over Toronto um, with, you know, the number of glass um, buildings that we have. Um, and sometimes, you know, uh, during construction, there's a lot of construction debris that gets onto the buildings. Um, and there's, you know, there's all these procedures and standards for how glass cleaning should be performed. Um, but unfortunately, nobody actually follows those plans. Um, and sometimes you see glass cleaners using scrapers on the glass. And if you're using scrapers on the glass to remove all this construction debris, debris and then you multiply that by like a thousand pieces of glass across the building, um, you could end up with a very costly problem. Like you could end up with thousands of pieces of glass, which are scratched, and now susceptible to premature failure because we've got these surface defects, right, which can lead to premature failure. Um, it can become a really costly plan. So uh, maintenance is also important in making sure that we don't end up with these really costly problems. And um, it's also important for, for those complex designs, you know, in the buildings, we're using all this fancy glass, you know, these fancy cladding panels. Um, you know, when we're, when we're thinking about maintenance, we also need to plan ahead. Like, if, if a piece of glass breaks or a panel, you know, gets damaged, um, do we want to leave the, the, the new building owners with this huge problem of having to reorder, uh, reorder the specialized glass or climb panel. I'm sure it's going to take, you know, weeks or months um, to replace that. So, you know, if you think ahead, um, you know, it's really easy during the construction phase just to order some additional panels as attic stock and, and have that on hand so that, you know, when you turn over the building to the owner, they have this, um, this, um, this supply of panels available to them in the case, in, you know, in case we run into issues such as, you know, breakage or damage. So really, um, our final thoughts to leave with you are, are yeah, unexpected things are going to happen, uh, but we can control them or minimize them by planning ahead and planning ahead and communicating with the whole uh, project team. Planning ahead in the time it takes for the workshops, the time it takes for the testing, the time it takes for um, the mock-ups and, and all the additional review, we understand it's, it can be costly and we understand that it can extend the schedule, uh, which like Andrea mentioned are, are two of the main drivers in any construction project. However, building a building, actually constructing a building, it's, it's pretty costly, it's pretty expensive to begin with. And then the added cost of having to go back and fix something that failed prematurely and fix something that you can't really get to easily and it's going to become a complicated fix is also even, even more expensive on top of that. So we should, we should try to push the industry to focus more on let's get these collaborative designs and, and let's get everybody communicating at the beginning and, and invest in that in our building because it's, it's a huge investment and we want to make sure that we're performing and we want to make sure we're getting a good end product. So it takes a little bit more on, on the beginning or on the front end of things. So we, we want to push for that as, as a group. So our final thoughts is basically plan ahead. Make sure you have enough room for everything when you're, when you're putting your whole project together. So... We're done our, our presentation, but we're here for any questions or discussions you might have, or if you're hungry and need some lunch, then I understand that too. I, I'm, I'm hungry. Um, but yeah, we'll open up the floor to, to any questions.